Uh, so I wanted to um, quickly pause and just take a detour because I know you mentioned uh, an idea right now where you said the, the famous word socialism, which has been kind of in the news recently um, as we see down south of the border. But um, I want to reflect because I think sometimes we misunderstand history. And by misunderstanding history, it's often that, um, I believe it was Plato that said those who control stories control society, the idea that like you have to be a good storyteller or the idea that stories... Um, are the ones that control the narrative by which we function in everyday life. So I know that collectively we all agreed in school, or I guess if you don't, then maybe you're part of a very marginal case, but we agreed that the, after the events of 1945, uh, we understood that Nazi Germany, like never again, we understood as a collective, as, as a consensus of the world, after we saw those photographs of the concentration camps, that never again, this will never happen again. But it seems as though, even though it's been like 30, almost three decades since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall, and how we've understood that sort of like communism is on like the ash heaps of history, there is still this flirtation with the bigger umbrella term of socialism. The idea that, um, well, pure capitalism in its, uh, in its innate um, form is, un as you mentioned, the, the, from the altruistic perspective, oh, it's unequal. Therefore, it causes division from an elite to a right, bourgeoisie to proletariat. Do you, do you see, uh, I know you've mentioned in previous podcasts and appearances, uh, can you describe the similarities? Because I think you've juxtaposed both Nazism and communism in the same way, in the sense that you would, I, I, I presume, and I, I believe the same way, particularly from our family history, considering mm -hmm. that our parents came from a part of Africa whereby uh, socialism was rampant. However, it wasn't branded as Marxism. Like, oh, we're not the Marxists, guys. We're, 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 we're socialists, but we like an African sense. Like uh, this, this idea of why it's still there, and particularly in Western circles. Yeah, I mean, there's no question, for example, that communism and Nazism are the same. There's no fundamental difference. There's certainly no difference in morality. They're both evil ideologies, evil ideologies that lead to death and destruction on a massive scale. Indeed, communism has killed more people than fascism uh, in its history. But socialism, which is just kind of a toned down, moderate version of communism, I, it has, and, and indeed communism itself, all have much better public relations than fascism, right? Nobody wants to be a Nazi. Nobody wants, nobody wants to associate with Nazis. Nobody, everybody walks out of a room if a Nazi walks in. But if somebody walks into a room and said, I'm a communist, everybody goes, oh, hi, you know, that's kind of interesting. And the reason is that socialism and Nazi, socialism and, and, and communism are very consistent with the prevailing moral code. And the prevailing moral code is a morality of, uh, of altruism, of sacrifice, of self-sacrifice, of collectivism, but a kind of collectivism that's different than the fascist collectivism and more similar than the communist collectivism. The thing that people hate about the fascist collectivism is not the collectivism. What they hate about it is that it was racist. What they hate about it is that it established some people as supposedly better genetically than other people. That's what they hate about it. The collectivism in and of itself, they don't mind. They, they hate, they, 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 they share the anti-individualism of the fascists. They just don't like the, the some groups are better than others. Now, in a sense, that exists in communism too, because if, if you read Karl Marx, uh, the, the, the proletarian get rid of all the other classes. And even some peoples who are not, who don't fit, are not fit to be proletarian, you get rid of. So communism has built into it the same kind of, the same kind of conflict as, as, as Nazism and fascism does, but people ignore that. It, people view communism and socialism as egalitarian. Egalitarian is treating everybody the same based on race and other issues, and ultimately leading to some kind of equality of outcome or equality of opportunity and a reduction in inequality of outcome but they all disregard the individual. They're all anti-individualist. What matters is the group, what matters is society, what matters is uh, the, 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 the whatever, however you want to create this association, this group that you created, whether it's the proletarian, whether it's society, whether it's your country, whatever it happens to be, they are all should be equal. Um, and the job of the individual in such a society is to sacrifice for the sake of the collective. Now, if you think about it, that's consistent with Christianity. 
it's consistent with almost every moral code that exists in the West. There's no opposition to that idea. Nobody stands up and says, no, we don't think that's right, that's just, that's moral. People might say, we don't think that works. We think you'll all be poor. Uh, you think it, has, it hasn't worked in history. But nobody says, the, and, and you, the idea is immoral. The idea is evil. Uh, indeed, you see the opposite. You see a lot of conservatives, a lot of people on the right say, you know, even, even Jordan Peterson, right? University of Toronto, you mentioned, so Jordan Peterson, says things like, no, no, you know, socialism and communism, wonderful ideas, beautiful ideas, just not practical. People want to be inspired. People want to have an ideal. So they're much more interested in the ideal than in the practicality. Mm -hmm. And that's why generation after generation, young people who are idealistic, who want to believe in something, become socialists because it's all that's presented to them. Mm -hmm. And people, the people who oppose socialism, what they need to do is rally around an alternative ideal. I believe that ideal is individualism. That ideal is objectivism. That ideal is an ideal of individual happiness. Uh, and the ideal is, is, is making the most of your life, living a great life, living a fantastic life. But for whatever reason, because of education and because of religion and because of everything else, we're conditioned to be in a group. We're conditioned to be in a collective. And, and most people are much more attracted, unfortunately, to the ideal of of collectivism and therefore socialism than they are to the ideal of individualism and therefore capitalism but and and, and they uh, as you said a lot of people have never heard of it right because who stood for the ideal of individualism and a morality of individualism ayn rand and pretty much nobody else yeah for sure uh, i want to segue quickly in, uh, into capitalism but also i want to relate what you just mentioned uh, with regards to this uh, ideal of young people being idealistic um, as someone who's during this whole uh, crisis that we've been in, kind of taken his uh, taken an interest in how the modern shaped world is today, I can think back to studying counterculture in the '60s and how much of a role it, 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 today's progressives. So, for example, people that espouse certain similar things that you're mentioning, like, like I think of like AOC, um, I think of left leaning parties here in Canada like the NDP. Um, these these ideas in the whether they were formed in the ac academy in the university systems, how much did the sixties and counterculture have to do with it? Was this was it um, which I'm I'm sort of on the edge of uh, in terms of my observation and my hypothesis after studying this, but is it the collapse of the importance of the church and the importance of the religious institutions in the sixties kind of that people young people began to look towards idealistic uh, they, they looked for somewhere else for that ideal and so they thought that the Marxist or the collective principles of me fighting for something greater than myself in the same realm of the, of the Christian Judeo Christian value system. Do you think that contributed? And then the mark, the university professors were just like pumping oil on the, on the fire basically. Well, I, I think all of that is true, but I think that the, the issue really is that the 1960s were a, a new phenomena the, the what Ayn Rand called it, the new left. And you're seeing that today, but that the shift was happening for decades before that. So the, the shift away from capitalism really started in the, in the 1880s and 90s with the progressive movement. Mm -hmm. And the progressive movement was already taking Marx's ideas, taking Hegel's ideas, undermining American individualism, bringing out the ideas of collectivism. But they still had this respect for ideas, respect for reason, respect for science, uh, they, were, they were Marxists, much more fundamentally Marxists, uh, but they was clearly undercutting American capitalism. And, and of course, American capitalism didn't die 10 years ago. It didn't die in the financial crisis. American capitalism died in 1890 when antitrust laws were passed for the first time. And, and in the you know, 19-teens, 1914, when income tax and, and the Federal Reserve was established in the 1930s with the Great New Deal, so with the New Deal, so the, the, the capitalism has been dying, being murdered really slowly for a long, long time. But what happened in the 1960s is a new generation came about who was reading the existentialist, who was reading the postmodernist, who was, was writing their own ideas. 
And they were now rejecting what's called the old left. They rejected Marx to a large extent. They rejected the old philosophers. They, they didn't know they were channeling them in some ways, but they reject. Their view is reason is impotent. Science is impotent. Remember, Marx argues for scientific socialism. The 60s are anti-scientific socialism, right? They don't want science in socialism. They just want their feelings. Go to Woodstock. It's not about Marx. Mm -hmm. It's about hedonism, emotion, self-expression without a self, if you will, right? Yeah. Um, so they want a kind of collectivism that's tribal and emotionalist and postmodern. Mm -hmm. So what you see from the 60s to today is the intellectual, and so their professors were these Marxists who were trying to tell them, oh, you know, no, 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 we still need the structure, we still need reason, we still need thought, we still need ideas, we still need evidence. Mm -hmm. And these kids are saying, no, we don't need any of that, we just need our emotions. We just said, you know, reality is meaningless. Reality is unknowable. We, it's all in our head. Uh, you're determined by your race. You're determined by your genes, whatever. It, all of this is nonsense. So, so that, and then they become the professors. So what you get over the last 40 years is that the new left, the 60s counter-revolution, are the dominant intellectuals in our culture. And what are they teaching? They're teaching critical race theory, which says that you're determined by your race and it's inherent in you. And therefore, as a white person, you should feel guilty. As a black person, you should feel uh, a victim, as a victim. And, 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 and you know, uh, and, and as a brown person, I guess somewhere in the middle. And, and there's this whole, you get a whole categorization of, of, uh, uh, of victimhood, right? Uh, which is this, uh, uh, what do they call it now? Uh, you, know, you know, they have this whole hierarchies of who's bigger victim. And the oppression it's, hierarchy? What's that? The oppression, the oppression hierarchy. hierarchy. Uh, there's a term which has just slipped through our mind, but um, intersectionality, right? The whole intersectionality movement is about this hierarchy of oppression, mm -hmm. and it has to do with your sexuality, and it has to do with your. They've discovered 92 sexes, and and it has to do with your your race, and they've discovered lots of different races, and and all of this is completely devout of science. It's completely. I mean, Marx would be shocked by it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, economics, which is Marx's hallmark, right? Economic class is only one of the many, many, many categories of oppression. And what they have done is they, they've completely made emotions as, a, as, as the most important thing in the world. That's why they view speech as violence. Because if you offend them, you hurt your emotions. That's like them being punched in the nose. They don't see a difference in that. And they have destroyed, they are the anti-enlightenment forces today. Now, I think they're pretty impotent because they don't have a theory. They don't have anything to stand on. They don't really have ideas. Their ideas are meaningless because at the end, it's all grounded in emotion. But they dominate the intellectual world today. And you hear their voices constantly. And this is what people like Jordan Peterson are speaking up against. But again, the challenge there is, you know, do you have a do you have a set of ideas to replace this? And that's where Peterson and others, I think, fail. They don't have something coherent, idealistic to replace these what what these intellectuals. And note, these intellectuals are not idealists. What's the idealism of critical race theory? It's not colorblindness. They don't believe in colorblindness. That was Martin Luther King. That's the old left. The new left doesn't believe in colorblindness. They want us all to be color, you know, conscious, right? Constantly think about color. Uh, is it socialism? Is it some socialist utopia? Not really. The, the, the postmodernist critical race theory people, are, they just want control. It's not about even socialism. It's about control. They want to run your life. They want to run your life based on some ridiculous hierarchy. But their system falls apart. There's no coherent ideology. Even AOC and to some extent Bernie Sanders are still to some extent remnants of the old left. They still believe in socialism, right? But the real, the, the, the people behind BLM, uh, Antifa, people like that, they don't believe in socialism. They believe in mayhem. 
They believe in destruction. They believe in hate. They believe in nothing. Uh, Ayn Rand called it, what they really worship is the zero, is nothingness. Um, and it's true that religion plays some role in here in two ways. One, the rejection of religion and the idea of what now, where the values come from. But also, I would argue, and Ayn Rand would argue, that religion conditions them towards emotionalism. Because what is religion? How do we know God exists? Because we feel it. There is no logical explanation. There's no rational explanation. So what, what religion conditions people is to feel, to have faith, to believe in revelation, and to be collectivist. And then these intellectuals capitalize on the fact that these kids are being raised religious to move them towards this nihilistic, you know, uh, uh, anarchistic is, uh, uh, point of view. But it's, they're not even fighting for an ideal anymore. There's some socialists out there believe in something. But, but the people in the streets, they don't believe in anything other than hatred. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at yourunbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>